because I've done this probably 10 or 12 times now, the curriculum's getting more and more pointed and we're, we're probably getting better and better at it. Uh, and so it sh this should be the best one or it could be the worst because I did this, well, it's not a PowerPoint presentation, it's a Canva pres presentation which I knocked up this morning just before you guys got here. So there's a map of all our locations. Uh, I threw up some um, images just to give you an indication of what we do there. thought that was pretty exciting. So you're at Dry Creek at the moment. This is our distribution center. So we would probably hold more irrigation than any other irrigation uh, retailer or trade store in South Australia, if not Australia. Um, we're able to do very large commercial projects from here. And if you have a delivery anywhere in South Australia, 90% of the time it's coming from here. So even if you're buying from our Kent Town location, if you're getting a delivery, it's probably coming from here because most of our stock's here and then most of our transport's here. Kent Town obviously being our first location. Oh, those boxes are to indicate bulk stock. Uh, that computer is to indicate irrigation design department. So that crew lives at Kent Town. We've got a four person design team there. Uh, and this little pile of dirt is to indicate that that's actually a landscape supplies yard, but also an irrigation store. So if you're using water pro and railways as your irrigation supplier, any location you go to, you're gonna get the same pricing, the same service, the same product range. Uh, so you can confidently go to railways uh, if you're on a Sunday looking for stuff and you can get all that stuff there. Then there's, uh, hang on, does this work? What's that? Point out your face? No, I was just gonna say they're mapped there, look at that. Very intelligently located business locations. What are you doing, bro? What are you doing, bro? Let me click. You, you just do the audio. All right, anyway. Uh, I've tried to, as I said, I've tried to keep it in some kind of order. So uh, as you'll notice in the book, this, there's a, this is kind of the most sense I can make of the order of training the basics of irrigation in such a, small, a short amount of time. So obviously the legal requirements and regulations, these are, the, these are the things we'll cover off today. And obviously if there's anything else that you can think of now that you want me to talk about, I'm happy to throw it up on the board and we can cover it. Or uh, throughout this, you can ask questions. Irrigation design and design principles. Uh, obviously parts, this is, a, it's kind of a, a weird one because most of you have probably done some irrig irrigation, but there's, there's probably this kind of 20% of the parts that you've never seen or that you haven't used or that you're not sure what they do. So I'll talk about that. Techniques, then troubleshooting, and then we'll do some hands-on. So we've got a, TV's got a blemish. This TV's about 40 minutes old, so that's interesting. It also costs 1200 bucks. So we've got an irrigation system set up outside where we will simulate uh, sprinklers and drip tube. Uh, so you'll be able to go out there, put some stuff together, play with sprinkler heads. Anyone here that has never clamped up a poly fitting or that wants to adjust an MP rotator or wants to adjust an R van or wants to take apart a solenoid valve and put it back together or wants to do some wire joining, today's your day. Uh, obviously, when we, we put that out to the group, most people don't care and have done it before. And so there'll usually be one or two that wants to get involved. So when we do go outside there to do the hands-on stuff, if you're interested in doing it and actually getting some real world because you haven't done it before, then uh, you're by, by all means welcome to do it. I have to leave here at four o'clock on the dot so you can be confident to know that we will finish by four. Uh, sometimes we finish a bit early and that'll give you an opportunity to stick around and have that um, conversation with either Mudge or myself if we finish early on something that you might've been too embarrassed to ask or that's something that's maybe specific to your business. Need a little holster for this. Uh, that's probably not ready for that yet. So if we go to the booklet here, uh, there's a fair bit of um, information at the start there, which is, it's really just, um, I'm not gonna go over it. You can read it if you want. A bit about me, a bit about Mudge. Obviously Mudge uh, is our business development manager. He takes care of uh, the relationship management for railways and, lawn, uh, and water pro, not lawn hub. And uh, has been with us, what, three years? Uh, his excitement and quality of service is his strength and his product knowledge is getting stronger. Is that fair? <laughs> oh, and he cooks a mean muffin. That coffee's a six out of 10. The, uh, yeah, so we obviously do our start of month, middle of month, end of month barbecues at all of our locations. If you're on our email list or staying across our socials, you'll see that and you're more than welcome to come past. There is no expectation for you to buy anything. It's just an opportunity to catch up with people and have something to eat. So if we go to tools. Now, this is gonna sound quite simple, but it, to start an irrigation installation or maintenance business is probably one of the easiest businesses to start that I know of. 
uh, effectively, all you need is a way to get places, probably a set of multi-grips and some cutters, which we don't even have. Yes, we do. So you could, oh, and a screwdriver. I reckon with these two and a screwdriver, you could probably start up an irrigation business. Now that causes some concern because obviously the barrier to entry to start an irrigation business is quite low and ultimately anyone can do it. So I say that as a warning almost for you, just because it's easy doesn't mean you should do it. And obviously, you know, leaving today's training session, you're not going to be ready to start an irrigation business. But I think that you should have enough knowledge to know where to go. And probably worth pointing out now, all of the locations that we have are available for you to use as far as you don't have to go buy stuff there. But if you are on site and you're struggling with something and you've tried YouTube and you can't find it, and YouTube's obviously a great resource. Oh, yeah. Now we are a professional irrigation installation business. We've got a drill. So you, you go to YouTube for a lot of other things and obviously you'll find how to put things together, take things apart, fix things. Irrigation is no different and quite often you'll find that the problem that you're having, the solution is there. But if you are struggling and it's four o'clock on a Friday afternoon and you've, got, you've done all the things that we've talked about today, which I'll, I'm pointing at that because there's relevant stuff there later. We've gone through all that and you just don't know why this solenoid valve won't turn on or it won't turn off and the client's going away for that weekend. Ring Mudge, ring, don't ring me. Ring Mudge, <laughs> I won't answer as most of you have experienced. Um, ring the stores and just talk through it. And sometimes it's nice just to have that, I guess, third party or second party in this case to just go, hey, have you tried this? And you'll be like, oh yeah, I didn't try that. And it might give you the solution that you need. Starting with multi-grips and cutters obviously is where it's at. As you expand your irrigation business, there's going to be a bunch of other tools that will come up. The basics are pretty much what we see here, you know, drills, shovels, spades, things to dig with, things to backfill with, uh, things to cut the sides of valve boxes with. And then as you grow into an advanced business, that's when you'll probably start looking at things like uh, uh, wire locators and uh, valve locators and that kind of thing. And then obviously you move into commercial, you've got electrofusion welding, decoders, that kind of thing. We're not going to talk about that today, uh, but it's worth knowing. One thing I would recommend if you are going to be doing irrigation once a week, once a fortnight, is to get a really good pair of wire strippers. The amount of time that you'll save using quality wire strippers and the quality of the work that you'll perform is more than covered by the, what are these, 40 bucks? Probably 40 bucks somewhere else, probably 60 here. No? So yeah, if you can get some good wire strippers, good cutters and some multi-grips and then obviously you're moving into your, your cobra clamp tool which is a tool that we use to close up metal clamps. I'm not sure if you guys have used metal clamps, if anyone's using them. Do you use them exclusively? What about you guys using plastic? Yep. Metal. Yep. So cobra clamps are a metal clamp, stainless steel clamp. The ones that we sell are made in Germany uh, that some people use exclusively and then others might use if they go do a job at Wyala or Mildura that they don't want to go back to. You don't, it doesn't really matter whether or not you use plastic or metal if you're buying them from us because the plastic clips we sell are made in South Australia. They're made by Antelco. They're a high quality plastic clip. They're not going to be breaking. They're not brittle like the ones that you might find at hardware shops that are likely imported uh, from countries that have a different quality of manufacturing but also are using a different plastic. So if you grab one of our clips, you should be able to open it right up and not snap it and you can reuse them. You won't find that you'll be able to do that with other brands. So moving on to licensing. Now, um, I probably wear two hats when it comes to licensing. Obviously, uh, I speak as a, you know, owner of an irrigation business, but I also talk as a board member for the Landscape Association. Uh, a large portion of you are involved in the landscaping industry. All of you are involved in the landscaping industry from what I can see. It's really important just to be aware of your licensing requirements. I'm not going to preach to you about it. The association's working on making the pathway to licensing more clear. Obviously, not necessarily easier, but more clear so that you guys don't need to feel like the licensing is behind this big wall of fire and it's quite easy to understand. Uh, if you have any, I guess, need to uh, find out more about that in South Australia, obviously go to Consumer and Business Affairs. If you're looking for someone to help you with your licensing, there's a link there to SA Trade Licensing. It's a guy called Sam who I did a podcast with probably four years ago. He used to work for the Office of Consumer and Business Affairs. Uh, very smart, but also easy to get along with human being that uh, understands the pathway to licensing and obviously can help with uh, mock interviews, preparing documents, all that kind of thing. And we, I spoke to a guy recently who's just left employment to start his own business and he was quite scared about the licensing process because 
he thought it was five thousand dollars and it was all this other and, and then once he'd sat with sam obviously sam has a fee but he found that um it made a lot more sense and it was quite easy and obviously licensing is not just the owner of the business there's the licensing that flows all the way through that's enough about licensing so a quality irrigation system starts with uh, a design and a specification now when we do our commercial training we talk a lot about specification because in most cases the way a system is going to be designed is dictated by someone else so it's either the council or it might be a, a developer so if you work for Westfield so they've got a, a company called Centre that builds Westfields they'll have a specification if you work, work for the Department of Transport they'll have a specification if you work for Playford Council they'll have a specification now if most of the, the work that you guys are doing is residential it's unlikely that you're going to run into a specification but it's worth asking and knowing whether or not there's one involved and if not I recommend for business owners to have some kind of a specification now obviously you just said we use metal clamps right that might not be documented anywhere but it's part of what you know about the business you also might only use hunter valves or you might only use rainbird controllers or you might only use mp rotators or you might only use netfm copper impregnated drip tube whatever it might be there's a specification related to the irrigation that you're installing and i really think that it's probably under thought about in a residential sense and you know as if i was doing installation still i'd have a standard spec that whatever my business is called i'm not going to say any names because it's i'll be rude so the that business we would always install you know a certain brand of poly pipe would always install a certain controller would always install a certain sprinkler unless the client asks for something else and the advantage of that obviously is that your staff will understand uh, how to fix repair change adjust program all that kind of thing because they're doing the same thing every day but there's less things that you need to hold as part of your kit to be able to repair uh, things or go back and fix things if you need to now uh, as i mentioned before at Kent Town, where we have the laptop, we have four full-time irrigation designers. They're predominantly there for commercial irrigation design, which is a paid service that we do, but residentially, we also do a lot of design. I'm not sure where you're at at, at each business, but we have everything from someone walking in and just grabbing stuff off the shelf because they know that what they want to do as a residential installer, all the way up to uh, CAD files being sent through to our team for us to design before the landscaper gets on site and we might be seeing those files 12 to 18 months before um, the job goes ahead so we can kind of work with you however you want and uh, obviously that's a free fee up to a level and then obviously it's it's not after that but I think most residential designs regardless of how we're doing them should be free uh, and then obviously if you don't buy the stuff from us you don't get the design uh, when we're doing irrigation designs the quality of the design is directly connected to the quality of the information that you give to us. And this is no different for any other irrigation shop. So you might find that, um, you know, there's, from a design standpoint, there's businesses that only do design and then there's shops that do free design. So if you went to see one of our competitors, you'd find that they most likely all do free irrigation design. They're going to need the same information. So this isn't purely what WaterPro need. They're going to need a scaled plan. I was trying to get a design to put up here, but obviously as I do things last minute, my team didn't have one ready in seven minutes as I required. So you can just imagine a plans up there somewhere, but the information that we will require is where they want the controller, where they're going to put the valves, what's lawn, what's garden, how they want to water the lawn, how they want to water the garden. Have they got the ability to get cable from the controller to the valves? That's important and we'll talk about that later. Are there height differences? So. You know, we've had sites where the physical height can affect the irrigation system from a pressure standpoint, but also from water draining out of a sprinkler. Now, I'll talk about it now while I remember, but there are parts that you can retrofit to sprinklers to stop the sprinkler from draining. So if you've got a, you know, this is a Hunter standard two inch pop-up, this is called a check valve. This can sit in the bottom of that sprinkler to stop water draining out. So if you've got a, I don't want to draw it. This whiteboard's so hard to clean. If you've got a hill and the sprinklers are going down the hill, what will happen when you turn the sprinklers, uh, when you turn the valve off up here, any water that's here will drain out the lowest point. By putting these check seals in, they all seal off and the pipe stays full of water. So the, the height matters because then the design department can go, okay, well, there's a lot of elevation here. We're either going to see an increase in pressure because gravity affects pressure or the height change affects the pressure that's coming out the sprinkler but also we might find that they're draining so we might want to put a, a check seal 
on each of the sprinklers to stop that from happening. Same with drip tube. Drip tube will open up at a certain pressure, so when you turn it off, you don't want it draining out, otherwise you're gonna find you're getting flooding as you will with this. And this doesn't have to be that much of a slope. Like if you've got a gradient like that, you're gonna find that water comes out the last sprinkler. So if you get all the information to our design department or any design department, uh, they will be able to give you the best quality results based on the best quality information. I'll talk about precipitation and design kind of principles a bit further in, uh, and then it will kind of all tie together. The, what I've tried to do here is talk about, like I said at the start, the, the stuff that really matters, like the legal stuff, the stuff that makes it better, then I guess quality parts, how to do it, like this should all kind of come together and make sense at the end. The, the parts, it's worth mentioning that we only stock quality products that we choose and where possible we'll choose South Australian manufactured products first and then obviously Australian manufactured products second. It's challenging now to find any electronics that are not made, that are, sorry, that are made in Australia. Uh, so you'll find that valve boxes, poly pipe, PVC pipe, that kind of thing, blue lines all made locally. In fact, our poly pipe's made next door on the block that's behind you. Uh, so if anyone's concerned about carbon miles, we are killing it there. But then obviously controllers, uh, solenoid valves, you know, I don't even know where AccuSyncs are made, but techno technologically more advanced things, things that aren't just air in a piece of plastic, generally come from China or Mexico. Let's see if that coffee's getting any better. Nope. Okay. Uh, if you have a look there, number four, backflow. I've made mention of it. Uh, backflow prevention is just as important in residential irrigation systems as it is in commercial irrigation systems. We've got a little board here I made which is meant to symbolize an irrigation system in a square meter, just so that I can use it to reference. You'll see this brass product here is a dual check. Uh, it's a non-return valve. It's designed to stop any water contaminants from coming from your irrigation system back into your drinking water. Now, when we go into commercial systems, we step up to a double check, which is a testable device. And then the next step up from that's an RPZ. So an RPZ is a reduced pressure zone. That would be used if you were installing subsurface drip irrigation in 2007 and you were pumping Treflam, which is a root intrusion uh, inhibitant chemical through the system. Or if you had a fertilizer injector, you'd be looking at really high-end backflow prevention. And I think fertilizer injectors are probably something that people aren't backflowing enough. Now, it's an unlikely reality, but it is a reality that if you don't put a non-return valve in an irrigation system, things that occur in your irrigation, so uh, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer, I don't know, um, animals pissing in your lawn, whatever it might be, if there's a breakage in the system, in drip tube or in a sprinkler system, it can draw those liquids back into your drinking water supply. By putting this back backflow prevention device in, it's an inexpensive insurance policy, plus it's also the law, which will stop you from not only contaminating your house, but then obviously contaminating the rest of your suburb. Those breakages can occur, and sometimes we'll see it if um, a breakage occurs on the road, it'll draw, like the, the physical pressure of the, the pipe breaking sucks water back through a system, and then it starts drawing in things. So um, if you're gonna look to try and save money on a system, this isn't where I'd be cutting costs. This is really important, so. Um, that is backflow. All right, now, for us to do a irrigation system design, we need a pressure and a flow. Um, the, everything that we sell has data attached to it. So the drip tube, we have flow rates, the sprinklers, we have uh, flow and meterages that they throw. And that's obviously because we deal with professional manufacturers and all that information ties back to how we do designs. So for us to be able to do a design well, we need to have the pressure versus flow test. So I'm just gonna test this. We haven't done this before, but I did a video the other day on how to use this. This is our pressure versus flow test kit that we have here, which we sell and lend and rent. So you're in a room of people that could borrow it for free. There's obviously people that we would charge to borrow it. And then there's obviously people that choose to buy them. If you're doing a lot of irrigation, it's probably worth owning one. What are they worth much? Like 180 or something? Uh, uh, pressure versus flow. Buy it from me, don't buy it from him. Yeah, mine's cash. All right. So 
I'll just show you this video. Just It's quicker for me to do this than to take you out there and see if this works. Can you play that, please? I'm going to teach you how to measure your pressure and your flow using this test kit. Hi, my name is Clint Adams, and today I'm here at WaterPro doing a flow versus pressure test on our garden tap. This is a kit that we have available here at WaterPro, and our clients use it to determine the flow and the pressure that they have available before we start looking at their irrigation requirements. Step one, we need to mount the pressure versus flow kit to the water source that we will be using. It's really important to use the water source that's going to be closest to the area that you're irrigating so you have the most accurate flow. The kit I have here today has multiple parts. This yellow hose is more likely to be used on a commercial site when someone might need to go into a valve box to get access to the water. Today, we will just be using this because we're coming straight off the tap. So the kit comes with various fittings that you can use uh, in any situation. Today, I'll be mounting a 20 by 25 mil bush to the garden tap. You'll see there's a bit of thread tape on the tap. That doesn't matter. If it leaks slightly, we're not too concerned. We're just using this for testing purposes. Now, the test kit has this barrel union on it, which means we can fit the test kit through that thread without actually having to physically turn the whole test kit. So it'll be interesting to see how tight this goes. I do have some multi-grips available and you might need to use them if uh, you do find that there's some small leaks or maybe you don't have the hand strength to tighten that up tightly. So currently I have water flowing freely. See? As you can see, I now have the pressure versus flow test kit mounted to the tap. This gauge here is a pressure gauge which measures uh, water pressure, what well, will measure any pressure, from zero to 1600 kilopascals. It's very unlikely that anything we're doing here in South Australia is going to get past that 1600. And then below this is a digital flow meter. This will measure the flow in liters per minute as it passes through. Traditionally, when we do uh, pressure versus flow tests, we might fill up a bucket and time how long it takes. This takes the guesswork out. So the first measurement that we're going to take is the static pressure. That's the pressure that it's currently under with no flow. When the ball valve is off, this is under pressure and it's called static pressure. As we open up that ball valve, we'll start measuring what is called dynamic pressure and that's the pressure on this gauge as water flows through here. Now, when you're dealing with an irrigation shop, they're going to ask you to maybe bring in two or three different uh, water flows. One will be completely open, one will be at a certain pressure, say 200 kPa, and one may be at 400 kPa or 300 kPa. The shop can use that information to, in, to calculate the water pressure versus flow, and then they can use that when they design your irrigation system. All right, so I'm gonna open this up all the way up now and probably wet Dylan. So we can see here, we've got about 70, 69 to 70 liters a minute coming through, and I'm getting very wet. Now I'll turn the pressure down, turn the gate, sorry, turn the ball valve down. So that's one, two, three, four, so we're at 300 kPa now and we're getting 38 liters a minute. And all you do is adjust this ball valve, which will adjust how much pressure. So if we turn it off more, we go up to 350 kPa, we're getting 24.9 liters a minute. We might open it up to go back to 200 kPa and we're getting 51.3 liters a minute. Record all of that information, bring it into the irrigation shop and the team will use that information to design your irrigation system. If you've got any questions about this or anything else that we do here at WaterPro, please do not hesitate to get in touch. We are here to help. So that's pressure versus flow test. Has anyone used one of them before? You've got, do you guys have one? It's probably a, a good point that um, theirs is a little bit different. It doesn't have to look like that. You can make your own. You could buy a pressure gauge and a ball valve and a flow gauge and build one yourself. Uh, they're really a service more than anything. The better quality, like I keep saying, the better quality the information is, the better quality our design is. Uh, for a long time, we'd ask what your flow is and people would say, oh, it's pretty good. And it's, it's a dangerous game because we're designing the system with pretty good pressure and then it doesn't work and that doesn't fall back on the trades people, it falls back on us. So the, the idea is, especially on commercial, so the question was why did I do multiple test points? So static pressure is important because that's the highest pressure that it, it will be. It's generally the pressure when it's off. Um, sometimes pressure will spike past that when you shut a valve off quickly and you'll get say 1200 kPa. 
if we had a really high static pressure, we might need to start thinking about different hardware. So a valve, these valves, the, the standard solenoid valves that you guys are using in all of your systems are rated to 1,034 kPa. If we had a 1,200 kPa static or a 16, well, probably 1,600 is getting stupid, but we might, if we had a 1,200 kPa static, we might put a pressure, sorry, we could either put a pressure reducer or a pressure limiting valve on. So you can get the fixed pressure reducers or we might put a 1,600 kPa rated solenoid valve as a master valve, which I'll talk about when we do the wiring of the valves. Um, and then those different points are so that you, our, our, we, our team have the most information possible. So when we design an irrigation system, we're looking to, the sprinklers probably need about 350 kPa to pop up and work effectively and drip tube needs to operate at about say 170 to 210 kPa. If we do a test, so as you saw there, we did a test at 300 and got 38 or something, and then fully open, we're getting 70. That's right, that's right. But once that system's pumping into a system, it's building up pressure, it's not open flow. But the, the issue we have is, if you design an irrigation system based on 200 kPa, and the flow is 60, when it should be really designed at 400 kPa where the flow is 30, it won't work. Because your system's sucking out this, you know, 60 liters of, of demand, but it can only get 200 kPa of pressure, which that, what it'll do is drip tube will work fine, but the sprinklers won't pop up. So we need to get the, ideally, I mean, worst, if, if we didn't have all of those numbers, a 450 would be perfect. 450, 500, so what, No, because it's not, the system's not fully open as such. Because when, and this, it's funny, this one here, that hose being in the bucket actually was putting pressure back up, up the thing, which I didn't think about when we were doing it. I was trying not to wet him and all of his hardware, but the, there will be people on YouTube that will have plenty to say about it, that it's not a true and correct pressure versus flow test because there's a bucket stopping it. What will happen once once that water comes into a system? It's not under completely open flow anymore because it's going into solenoid valves and a manifold. So commercially, we need about 470 minimum because by the time you go through, you might lose 50 through here, and then you'll lose say 10 or 20 through a solenoid valve, and then you'll have kind of what I call micro losses through elbows and just friction. Uh, so if we only if we could only get one flow rate, I'd probably ask for it to be at 500 kPa because then the team can work around that. Um, but then if the static showed that it was 900 or 1200, then we'd go, okay, we need to really think about this because that much pressure means that the system's going to be taking in, say, probably 830 by the time it goes through all the headworks. We need to start reducing pressure on not just the drip tube valves, but also the sprinkler valves because they won't operate properly. So which I'll, I'll talk about it now. It'll probably It's probably something that should be later, but the hardware that we supply irrigation through is designed to work at specific pressures. And if you get a Hunter MP rotator chart, which we might have some of, you'll see all sprinkler, all sprinkler charts have data that talks about the pressure, the flow, their precipitation, which is the next thing I'm going to talk about, which is probably a decent chunk of what we do. Um, if you put too much pressure in, you'll find that they're delivering inaccurate amounts of water. And everything we do as a professional irrigation shop is really tied back to precipitation and making sure that we're simulating rainfall more accurately than rainfall would, would, would occur. Now, if you put, put too much pressure into a dripper or too much pressure into a spray, you'll find you'll get misting from the sprays. You'll find MP rotators don't adjust properly. You'll find that pressure compensating drip tube, tube doesn't deliver the amount of water that it's meant to deliver. And then you're not getting that match precipitation. And you know, all of the work that we do around designing a system kind of just doesn't become irrelevant, but, but it becomes less accurate because we haven't done those one percenters. It would still work, and most people probably wouldn't know, and on a Kaikuya lawn that's getting overwatered, you'd never pick up on it, and the garden's probably going to be fine. I mean, the inaccuracy between too much pressure and not enough pressure on a 50-meter line of drip tube, and this is not an exact number, but it might be 10%. So you, you might say you get 1.6 litres an hour out of that dripper and 1.7 out of that one or 1.5 out of that one. You're still watering and it's probably fine. But the people that we deal with, especially on a commercial level, they don't accept that like because they don't have to. They're saying we're willing to pay 
what it's worth to get a quality system. You've tendered for it. We want to check that it meets that standard, and if not, we're not paying for it because that's what you've priced us. And I guess residentially, you're probably not seeing it as much, but... Um, When there's less, yeah. So, yeah. So the comment was on smaller gardens, they see that there's probably some inconsistencies with the amount of water that's coming out of drip tube, even with pressure reducers. You can audit that. I mean, I did it the other day in our front yard. We've got a really large tree, like it would cut, it would fill this area, and there's, um, I guess that what is it creeping something, everyone puts it in fucking gardens now, like, I don't know what it's called, what's that? It just, it's that, like, it's a, like a real dark green leaf, it's meant to just, it's a ground cover something, I don't know, anyway, it's not growing very well, and my wife's like, the irrigation's not working, because that's what, what it must be, I said, it's probably the tree, it's probably taking a lot of water, so I put, uh, I had a catch can, because I've got some catch cans at home because we were filming some stuff in the front yard. So I put a catch can under, so I picked the drip tube up and put the catch can under the dripper and measured how much water came out of the dripper for a half an hour cycle. I was like, no, nah, it's watering fine. I think sometimes we can think it might not be working. And the beautiful thing about irrigation, especially if it's installed properly, is you can test it. T too much water. Adjust your scheduling. Which is what, and look, we'll talk about that. We've obviously got the, um, I'm going to talk about precipitation now. I don't know if I answered this question fully. When, so what, what Ollie was asking was like, why do we take multiple pressures and flows at pressures? My team can create a curve, like a, a it's almost like a pump curve for, for mains water. And so then by having multiple options, we can uh, use those at the design space level we probably don't need that many um we could probably get away with a static and an open flow and maybe a 500 yeah the more information because what will happen is my design team will start doing something and they'll send an email to the client which obviously goes i don't know to uganda and sits there for five days and then we get a response back five days later that five days we haven't had any work done on the design but the client goes well you've had it for five days so the more information we can get at the start Obviously, the more likely we are to be able to finish the job and do a good job. All right, precipitation. So what I'll do, we'll talk about, I want to make sure you guys get a break. I might talk about precipitation. We'll try and have a break at 2.30 so you can call your parents, I don't know, have a smoke. Um, and we'll have a 10-minute break, then I'll finish the rest of it, then we'll go outside and get wet. So precipitation, there's a bit of information in there about what precipitation is, and we've got a, a, a definition from... Hunter, and I think we've got a definition from Wikipedia, which is probably a long time old now, so it's probably not relevant anymore. But effectively, with irrigation, what we're trying to do is simulate, not even simulate rainfall, we're, we're basically replacing rainfall and doing it more evenly. And the reason we use professional products and irrigation designers is so that we know the theoretical distribution of that precipitation. This is, I know these are a lot of big words. It'll make a lot of sense once I kind of drill into it. So for every square meter of rainfall that has one millimeter of rainfall on it, there's one liter on that square meter. And so we can work out, you know, how much rain could be collected on a roof. So if we've got a hundred square meter roof and we get 10 mil of rain, We've got 10 times 100 is 1,000. We've caught 1,000 litres of rain. So that we use that calculation to calculate how much water might go into a rainwater tank. So if we've got this shed here, which is 1,000 square metres, you know, for every 10 mil of rain, we've got 10,000 litres. We can go, well, that's a fair bit of water. If we only put a 10,000 litre rainwater tank out there, it's going to be full in 10 mil, and then all the other water's getting lost. And then when we work out the precipitation of an irrigation system, it's the reverse of that. So we can go, well, we know that this oval takes, I don't know, to, we, we want to do 25 mil a week. If we do it for 100, um, or if each sprinkler delivers 25 mil an hour, we water for 100 hours, we've got 2,500 litres of water that's been used. So I'll talk through 
the sprinklers first and then we'll talk about drip tube. So we can, we can create what's called matched precipitation with either a matched precipitation product, so MP Rotator, the MP in MP Rotator is for matched precipitation, or our designers can create what's called matched precipitation using, a, using the way we design systems. So traditionally in the late 90s, early 2000s, if we needed to design an irrigation system and wanted matched precipitation, we didn't have the luxury of using a, an MP rotator. So what we had to do is nozzle down or adjust the times. So this is a very extreme example. This is an oval, and we still use this today, that the sprinklers that are in the middle of an oval are turning 360s, and the sprinklers that are on the side of the oval are loosely doing 180. And so with a, a non-matched precipitation nozzle, these sprinklers here, if they've put on the same station, will go past the same area of grass twice as often. So what you'll find is they're putting out twice as much water per square meter of turf as the ones in the middle. Does that make sense? So as a designer, we'll either put those sprinklers on a different station, so all of the blue sprinklers would be on their own station, or they might be three stations, and then all the yellow sprinklers would be on a different station, and we'd adjust the watering to suit. Or we'd nozzle them down. So with a gear drives, we might have, um, and these aren't exact numbers, but if we had um, an eight gallon per minute nozzle in the middle, we'd put a four gallon per minute nozzle on the outside, and then obviously you're getting twice as much pass. And then that would enable us to put the half circles and the full circles on the same valve, because in some cases we have to, uh, just the way that the ovals are or um, the way that the client wants it to operate. Uh, then obviously in other cases, the client might have those as 360s and then they just, they're watering the outer and it doesn't matter. So back when I first started in, ir in irrigation, we were using what were PSO2s and PSO4s, which were the standard pop-up sprinkler that just sprayed mist. It was red, green, black, and what was like an opaque white color or, or a gray. 10A, 12A, 15A, 17A. Through a 10 foot radius, 12 foot radius, 15 foot radius, 17 foot radius. And most residential irrigation was done that way. The issue was that if you had a system that was slightly not perfect, so you might have an area like that where that was three meters, and that was, say, five, which makes that, what, eight. You could put the three meter sprays there, but then once you start moving out to here, if that's five meters, the amount of water that the five meter sprinklers put out was higher than the amount of water that the three meters put out in the same amount of time. What would happen then is, uh, I would say these had more, I'd have to check, but there's inconsistencies between that grass and that grass. Now, with precipitation, what we're trying to achieve is to be able to give whoever's scheduling the irrigation system the amount of water that it will deliver in a period of time. So I, I tried to kind of create some, um, some models here for, for you to understand. Like I said before, so if you've got that one square meter of area has one mil of rain, it's one liter of water, right? So that's important to remember. Now, all every product that we use, depending on how it's designed, will deliver different amounts of water. So one of the really easy things to understand is the MP rotators put out 10 mil of equivalent rainfall every hour. So the square, so one square metre gets 10 mil of rainfall, therefore it's got 10 litres of water. And so using that information, uh, if you're a, um, a council or you're a, um, even if, for what you're doing, you can actually work out how much water the area might need and then you can use this information to work out how long you want to water for. And then you can start to use that information along with weather data to work out whether or not you want to water today or if you want to supplement some of the rain that we've had because we get this with councils where uh, they'll be irrigating while it's raining. And, you know, obviously there's people at home that know more about irrigation than the local councils and they treat that as a good opportunity to ring their local member and give them an irrigation lesson. But we've only had four mil of rain and we haven't had rain for a month. And we needed to put out 20 mil of rain because the, that's what the turf requires. The other thing that you can use precipitation for is to understand the application of water when you're treating uh, lawns for, um, say you've got a bug infestation and you put out a product that needs to have 10 mil of water. Uh, lawn hubs wet, for example, needs 10 or 11 mil of 
equivalent rainfall to water it in, otherwise it burns the grass. And so what you can do is go, okay, well, I know the MP rotator delivers water at 10 mil an hour. I'm putting out this chemical. I'm going to water it for an hour. It's had 10 mil. Cool. Beyond that, my lawn in general, when it's this weather, kind of 30, needs 25 mil a week. So I'm going to equally divide up that 2.5 hours of watering over whatever period. I've watered in some wetting agents today for an hour. I might wait four days and do another hour and that's 20 mil for the week and then I might supplement the other half or I might do it over two waterings. Does that all make sense? There's a lot there, but it's not, it's kind of like, I, I used to use the analogy of programming a VCR and then like he's looked at me all weird, like what's a fucking VCR? But we, once you know this, like it's, it's just clear and you'll go, okay, that's cool. So I know that the MP rotator is a 10 mil sprinkler. I know that the Rainbird R van is a 16 mil sprinkler. I know that if we start using the old school pop-ups, we're looking at 40 mil. That's a, that's a really relevant number to know. So if you're watering this with 40 mil of equivalent rainfall, you can't have it on for an hour. And so there'll be situations where uh, you might go to a house and the sprinklers aren't popping up anymore. It's in a subdivision where they've split and split and split and split and there's just not enough water flow or pressure for those sprinklers to pop up anymore. But you know you can screw the heads off, throw them out, put um, MP rotators on, system sorted. No new solenoid valves, no new controllers. It's nice and easy. The elderly couple that live there have been watering for, I don't know, 15 minutes. That's fine. Floods the lawn. Lawn's been healthy. Then they go, oh, well, we'll just keep the scheduling the same. It doesn't work because when you're watering like that with an MP rotator for 15 minutes, you're getting two and a half mil. It's not, it'll evaporate. It's not even enough to, you know, start to penetrate the soil. So knowing the application or the, the, I guess the precipitation rate of each of the things is the starting point. Then we take the, I, I did a little, where is my little clicker? I did a Venn diagram. You like that? This is my morning. This is $1,000 worth of brain power right here. So once we know what our precipitation is and what our water requirements are and our scheduling, that's when we get to efficient watering. So you might know that your lawn needs 25 mil, but you find the garden probably only needs 20 or 16 or whatever it might be. Once you know that, then you can work out how many minutes you want to water for in any given period and you've got efficient watering. I'm still whiteboarding this. It'll get better. I wanted to have the colors overlay. Okay. If that's watered with Hunter MP rotators, every one of those sprinklers is actually the, actually the same. They're all an MP1000. We'll say that that's four meters. What I've done there is to try and show you that pink sprinkler sprays there, the one, that blue one sprays there, the yellow one sprays there, and so on. I talked about catch cans before. They're a, a, a way that we can test precipitation. If we put catch cans out there, the theory is that every single one of them will have the same amount of water in it over any period of time. Now, it's never perfect. And when we do commercial irrigation designs for Playford Council is a good example, um, we will design to a theoretical distribution uniformity. So Matt Irving is the brains behind this operation and he'll be able to explain this much better in advanced than I will even attempt to. But when we take those catch cans, we take the lowest quarter of the volume and compare it against the, the rest, the average of the rest, and you get a percentage. Now, most ovals we go out and test might be 45, 55, 60. That's the actual distribution uniformity. The theoretical, so we'll have a, a theoretical design distribution uniformity, so how much water it should do. So this is like, we do it all nice on the piece of paper and give it to you and you go out into the real world where there's rocks and, and tree roots and trees and wind and birds and customers and you put it in and you get a different result, right? The idea is that the theoretical design is as close as possible to the real world design and you've done a great job. And if we take the information from the pressure versus flow test, we take it to the design department, they do a match precipitation design, you buy the materials, you put them in accurately if anything doesn't work how you think it's meant to be, it's really, really easy for us to find out why. Because there's only so many things that can, like everything's got like science, uh, maths and physics connected to it. Every sprinkler is supposed to do a certain thing. Every flow versus pressure test has been recorded. Really, really good one for anyone that's um, not doing it now. I would be video recording my flow versus pressure tests on every job site and saving it on your server or wherever you keep it. 
there's a strong reality that you're, you're going to have a change in your pressure versus flow or something environmental is going to occur. If you've got a video of your pressure versus flow and even start putting it in your quotes and going, uh, the irrigation system is $3,680 including GST. We only use blah, 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 high quality stuff. At the moment, we, uh, at the time of quoting, your front tap was 36 litres a minute at 500 kPa. Your back tap was 32 litres a minute at 500 kPa. If we are successful with this job, we will perform another pressure versus flow test. If these numbers are, are different, we may need to look at requoting your irrigation because situations, not only does that protect your ass, how good do you look? Like you're quoting against everyone else who's just like, yeah, fucking like, all right, we'll just do a tap timer, eh, and like 700 bucks. Or you've got this system that you're like, well, we'll just put $40,000 worth of plants in and this is the system and this is why. And I think, I mean, that's really the main reason we do education is to enable you to be better at installing it, but also better at then selling it. So that's sprinklers. Um, I think higher than anything else, just know that if this doesn't make sense, you know enough about it to come to us and, and get someone here to explain it, why, why you should do something or what products you should be using or what products you could be using. Knowing this also explains why when someone comes in here and goes, can we just leave those two off and we'll just do that and we'll just turn it on and leave it on until it floods and just like, just hope for the best, it doesn't work. So that's sprinklers. Any questions about sprinklers? Okay. I do this a lot, so I kind of, I might breeze through it. So I just want to make sure that I haven't missed anything, but that, that's, Drip tube. So, drip tube is no different, sorry, it's completely different, but it's no different from a precipitation standpoint. We have information that's connected to the drip tube that will enable us to work out precipitation. So, this one might require a bit of whiteboarding. So, we, we had a, say it's 100 square meters of garden bed, right? In South Australia, the majority of the systems we are trying to design close to 10 mil an hour. And the reason we do that for the councils is because it gives them a very easy number to work with. So if they've got Hunter MP rotators at 10 mil an hour and they've got drip tube at 10 mil an hour, all these designs will have a spreadsheet on there with valve number, um, number of sprinklers or square meterages of drip tube, number of minutes required to deliver 10 mil of water. And this is something that, that gets taken into council that they can use to then schedule. And you could use this in residential landscaping. You think about like the quality of that, like station one, MP rotators, number of time to deliver 10 mil an hour, one hour or to deliver 10 mil an hour. With drip tube, for us to get 10 mil of equivalent rainfall, it's 0.4, 0.4, 1 1.6. So this drip tube we've got up here, uh, we obviously stock 0.3, we stock 0.4. Some people stock 0.5. Uh, we generally only hold 1.6 litres an hour. Some people hold two, some people hold 3.5, which is just getting stupid. When you start to understand, you know what we're missing from the Venn diagram? Soil profile needs four circles. Your soil needs to be able to take the water that's being delivered. And in South Australia, most of the soil, it can't take 17 and 25 mil. And if you start putting out 300 mil spacing drip tube at 3.5 liters an hour, that's like 30 mil. And that's when you start to see flooding. And obviously you can do cycle and soak where you might program the controller to come on for half an hour, wait for an hour, come on for half an hour, wait for an hour, but it's just unnecessary. So when we do drip tube, 90% of the time it's 0.4, 0.4. What these black dots, symbolize is the dripper and what the blue circle symbolize is the water spreading under the ground. And if we put these drip tubes 400 apart and the drippers are 400 apart, we have a grid of drippers 400 by 400, which is really badly an example of it is there. And then, I don't know, there's a few ways to work this out. So you can Google this and you'll always find out how to work out the precipitation. But if you've got if I, do, if I have 100 square meters, I times it by 2.5 or divide it by 0.4. So that's 100 square meters there. That'll give us the meters of tube because we've got one every 400, right? So uh, that's 250 meters of tube. And there's a dripper every 400, so we can times it by 2.5 or we'll divide it by 0.4 again. which is what, six? Yeah. 
I've done this that much, I should know the numbers. This will be on the next, when we do a revision three, you should come to that one, it's gonna be really good. 625. So then there's 625 drippers in here, times by 1.6 should be 1,000 or close to it. So 100 square metres, 0.4.4, you've got, so this is good for quoting, right? So you know you need to put 250 metres of tube, which equates to 625 drippers. They're doing 1.6 litres per hour, which means 1,000 litres per hour. Knowing what we know, going backwards, a thousand liters is divided by so a thousand liters over a hundred square meters is a thousand. So you divide it by hundred, you get back to your mill. This is why I'm not a maths teacher. So a thousand is a thousand over a hundred square over a hundred square meters. You're getting ten mil an hour. Does that make sense? I can't explain how I worked that out, but a thousand litres over that whole area is 10 mil. Now, I had a, um, or, or 10 litres per metre square. I had a message come through, we had a lawn hub live the other day, and a guy said, without a fancy irrigation system, how am I supposed to work out if I put out enough water? So obviously, if we apply Trojan or wet, we need to water it in, and we'll say you need to do 10 mil of water. But if you're doing that with a hose, how do you do it? So it's no different. You work out how much water's coming out of your hose. So you might say you've got 30 litres a minute coming out of your hose. You know you need to put 1,000 litres over the 100 square metres. So you get your 1,000 divided by 30. That's how many minutes you need to stand there for with a garden hose to get 10 mil. Now, you also have to add the, you need to evenly spread that water over that area. But it might be close enough and it might be fine. Not everyone can afford an irrigation system, but then they can work out that maths. So that's the precipitation of drip tube. When you start going up into like closer spacings and higher flows, it gets a little bit out of control. And all of a sudden you've got um, lots more valves. So obviously the more water that's going out here in a short amount of time, the more valves you need because of, we've done that pressure versus flow test. We find that 10 mil works really well with 0.4, 0 0.4. You're not buying too much tube. Obviously, 0.3, 0.3 is a lot more tube. It's a lot more valves. It's a bigger controller and it's more cable. So, um, does that make sense? Cool. So, that's sprinklers and drip tube. There's a little table on page 10 around spray and the differences between van. So, van is variable arc nozzle. That's the old traditional spray. Impact, which is the ones that you probably don't even see anymore gear drives, MP rotor, ro rotators and R bands. Kind of put simply, the ones that put out uh, more water need more water, right? It's, it's pretty common sense. And this table is a real common sense table. If you want a low precipitation nozzle, it needs to be left on for longer to get the same amount of water as a high precipitation nozzle for shorter. And there's pros and cons there. Obviously the infrastructure cost um, it's all connected, right? So if you've got um, MP rotated nozzles, you might find that you can water a larger area, which means less solenoid valves, but you're leaving it on for longer. If I was in a situation where we had uh, you know, water restrictions and we could only water for two hours a day, I would put a 100,000 litre rainwater tank in my house and I'd put out 100 mil an hour on all my stations and I would just flood things. Thankfully, we don't need to do that. And obviously, the idea behind these low flow nozzles is that when we do get drought conditions it's very likely in my opinion that mp rotators will always be allowed to be used because they're watermark approved don't quote me on that if it comes up but i'm pretty confident they'll be fine drip tube was mp rotators and are a 10 mil sprinkler and drip tube installed like that's a 10 mil drip tube what's the difference right like they're both delivering the same amount of water and because people have got this thing in their head where they only need to water for half an hour or 20 minutes they're not going to put out that much water if they're using mp rotators so um I'll leave it there for that. We'll have a break now for 10 minutes. We'll come back at 2.37 um, and we'll go on with some hardware stuff, controllers, that kind of thing. Uh, I'll go back to that slide. Good little place, maker. So, so far we've talked about uh, design and precipitation and then sprinklers and drip tube and obviously I haven't really shown you a lot of it. I, I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with drip tube and polypipe and 
just close it. It's their problem. The next stage, so once you've installed uh, the hardware that puts out the water, the next thing is to install the hardware that tells the water to turn on and off. Now, I don't know how much I've got there. So this, this, this is a document that we've kind of been evolving over the last couple of years. And we didn't even have a document before my wife got involved. It was just me standing up here talking and hoping to remember everything from the last one. But when it comes to control, the most simple thing is it's really just turning on or turning off the irrigation system that we've put in. And we've talked about how precipitation rates relate to scheduling. You could have a manual system where you just turn on a valve or turn on a tap and then remember to turn it off or set a timer and go turn it off. And it does exactly the same thing as an irrigation controller does. Obviously, the only variable is you remembering. Now, that's fine if you're home all the time and it's fine if you're willing to just wait for your irrigation. We've got plenty of customers that love watching sprinklers and they'll stay home for it. But irrigation's probably had the most advancements in its, its own world in the last five to seven years with the introduction of Wi-Fi controllers, Bluetooth controllers, weather-based scheduling and it's really creeped into the residential world now which it wasn't you know when I first started in the irrigation industry 15 years ago a controller was effectively a dumb controller which you would program and it would turn on and off you'd have rain sensors which I think are bullshit and then that was it you couldn't I mean even now this is and this is how shocking this is the whole mechanic not servicing their car situation I still manually water my irrigate my my house from, I've got two controllers, I've got a Rainbird on Wi-Fi and I've got a Hunter on Wi-Fi, both apps in my pocket and I still turn them on manually when I feel like I need to water because, I don't know, I just haven't got to the point of actually setting scheduling but use me as an exception more than a rule. You now have technology available to you from a controller standpoint where you can install at the highest level the Hunter HydroWise controller with a flow sensor, master valve and solenoid valves which will adjust watering based on weather and the rules that you set. It will identify what flow rate should be passing through a solenoid valve and alert you if there's a change and turn off the master valve if there's a change, which is quite a commercial thing uh, that you are, have the ability to do that. And it's not really something we sell a lot of because the hardware costs is so high. But if you had a client that might have a, a rainwater uh, tanks where they've only got 100,000 litres or 200,000 litres of rainwater on a property where if the water's not there, they don't get, you know, they're in trouble, they can't shower and they can't drink. Uh, they might look to put something like that on so that if there was a breakage in the irrigation system, it might notify them that there's something and turn it off and give them an opportunity to go fix it. The other side of that as a business, uh, you might set it up that um, all irrigation systems that you put in have an option of going onto this um, managed plan where the notification of the break comes through to you rather to them. And so they might be in their holiday house somewhere and uh, you just get a notification saying that such and such a house in Unley Parks had a high flow event on station one and then Monday morning you go there, you realise one of the sprinklers is broken or something's been vandalised, you can fix it, send them a report, bill them and they don't have to think about it. So there's, there's business segments there that don't exist. No one's doing that. And I've been talking about this, that that business model in tr these trainings for probably five years and no one's done it. And I say it every time, like you could create a business or a, even a better business just by doing that. And it's hard because you've got to find those clients that are willing to spend an extra $1,500 on the hardware from a control standpoint, but they're out there. And there's plenty of people out there that want that level of control and that level of protection around their water. So it doesn't really matter how you're turning your irrigation on and off. Obviously, you can go to a controller, you can have a Wi-Fi controller, you could just turn the, ta turn the tap on you could just turn a ball valve on. Important to remember that if you are using tap timers that you mount to a tap, so the ones that we sell and the ones that you get at hardware shops, they can dramatically reduce the amount of flow and pressure that passes through the inside of those tap timers. Uh, we had a situation probably a year or two ago where we sent, we did a design, <laughs> the team probably hadn't been trained on it and it kind of just went out and they had a tap timer and it wouldn't work. And this goes back to what I was talking about before with if you understand all of the variables, when something doesn't work, it's very easy to work out why. And we worked out that those tap timers weren't letting enough water through. And so when he removed the tap timer and just ran the system straight off the tap, the system worked. When he put it through a tap timer, it didn't. 
uh, because we'd never had that experience before, we gave him another tap timer for free, manifolded them, fixed the situation, split his system in two, and he was happy. And then we changed our internal policies, not in writing. Um, we were just talking about policies around irrigation before. Uh, and just told the team, you just need to be careful. You shouldn't really be designing irrigation systems above 20 litres a minute for any tap timer, except for the Hunter one, which I don't have one here. Uh, Mudge usually will bring it out about now when I say it. It's got a larger internal bore on the timer, and obviously it's a bit more, well, it's a professional brand that's making products that sit in an unprofessional world. If you can avoid using tap timers, my advice would be to avoid using tap timers. They're usually not pressure rated as high as solenoid valves. Obviously, they require batteries uh, to be changed, uh, and they're probably not as versatile from a programming standpoint. So if you can avoid it, don't you? If you can avoid it, avoid it. If not, I get it sometimes um, you can't. I get very nervous when I see people buy $40 tap timers to take up to their holiday house that's two and a half hours away and stick them on a tap and think that everything is going to be all right. So um, if you're going to have a tap timer, if you have to have a tap timer, I'd have it at home. So I don't have any manifolds. Oh, he brought out some manifolds. We've got these new manifolds. So oh. if we refer back to my irrigation system here, it all starts at a water source. Obviously, we've tr uh, tested our water pressure and flow. We know what it is. This is an example of uh, how some people might take water for an irrigation system. So they'll take the tap off, drop some blue line down and go into a manifold. It's not ideal. You'll see blue line above ground. It's pretty ugly. But you know, imagine that's copper or anything else. You could have had a plumber come and do it. Alternatively, this is a water meter and you've had a plumber come and add a ball valve and take it off. We talked about backflow prevention device. That's the first thing that's there. These fittings here are barrel union fittings. So they're a, a swivel fitting. So you can turn these nuts without the whole fitting turning, which means we can remove solenoid valves for maintenance without actually having to rip it out or cut it out. These are a new manifold that we've had uh, added to our range recently. One of our competitors had a, uh, a similar one and we couldn't get it and one of our suppliers found it. I haven't used these. I don't really know how good they are. People seem to rate them, but they slide apart using these clips. If you want to have a look at them, pass them around. Really, the key difference with a, a manifold like that versus making a manifold out of PVC is the maintenance side of things. Now, when I used to install irrigation, I'd glue PVC manifolds together. I'd be able to make a manifold in, I don't know, 20 minutes and for like $8. Whereas you're probably finding, I don't even know what they'd be worth now, but these used to be about $10 a valve for the actual manifold. So they're more cost effective. They're probably easier from a maintenance standpoint. I found that these would have problems more than my manifolds. I, I, I made my manifolds well. They were glued. And they, once you've done it right, you shouldn't have to touch it. But if you do what you're supposed, if you do what you meant, if, if you do what they say to do with these, you won't have problems. They say don't tighten them up with multi-grips and, you know, you kind of have to. You, if you don't, you're generally going to have leaks. And obviously, everyone's tension on multi-grips is different. But just be careful. If you tighten these up too much, you might find that they squash the O-ring and they leak. The manifold fittings that we see here have O-rings in every part. If there's an O-ring, you don't need thread tape. So you'll see underneath there, we've got uh, nipples coming out. There is thread tape. You want to thread tape all mains pressure rated non-O-ring fittings. If we didn't thread tape these directors, it probably wouldn't be the end of the world, but we do. And it's very, very important that I mentioned you never, ever, ever thread tape a sprinkler. So you'll find on the bottom of most sprinklers it says something like no pipe dope, which is an American uh, term for thread tape. These are a tapered thread. When they screw in here, they get tighter as they get closer to the end. They don't leak. And worst case, they do leak. They only leak when they're on and they're leaking into an area that you're trying to deliver water anyway, so it's not an issue. The risk of thread taping these, especially the gear drives, if the thread tape gets into the sprinkler, it'll start to cause issues. MP rotators are a good example of the most sensitive sprinkler you'll ever use in your life. Um, it's really important to make sure, this is probably something I should have talked about before, that when you're installing irrigation, and I can probably talk a bit more about it out there, every time one of these black pipes or one of these brown pipes is near the ground. It is not touching the ground. It's not scooping up dirt. You could go to the extreme of sticking duct tape over the pipes while you're installing them. And I know people that do. 
you, w you can flush them out. Obviously, a as a, you know, a new install, you keep the last fitting off and blow water out of it. The best way to keep them clean is to not get them dirty in the first place uh, because if you get dirt, especially in an MP rotator nozzle, you're going to find that you're probably going to have to replace it. The Hunter, uh, sorry, the Rainbird R vans, you can lift the head a little bit and they will flush. And obviously, we can flush drip tube with flushing valves. You probably can't see down there, but I've got a, just a manual valve that we can use to let water out. We don't, I don't know, I haven't worked behind the counter for a long time, especially for a new irrigation system. When I do work, it's just to scan stuff for people that know what they're doing. Air release valves and flushing valves are something that we would recommend you put on all drip irrigation systems. The air release valve is designed to let the air out when a system turns off and let the air out when a system turns on. I probably wouldn't put an air release valve in a system if I put a new one in today, if I was using the non-drain drip tube. Usually once the drip tube is full of water, the Netafim anti-siphon non-drain should stay full of water unless it's got a, an elevation situation where the head pressure lets water out of the drip tube. So look, buy an air release valve if you want, or if you don't, don't. I mean, probably better off listening to the people here that sell it than me. Um, I would still be putting flushing valves on. I think it's important to be able to just flush water through there. Most, not most, it's likely that if you get dirt in an irrigation system, it might not be your fault. It could be the fault of uh, a breakage outside of the property that's been drawn into the property. If it gets through the valves, it might get into the drip tube. It's unlikely to get through the valves. Usually you'll find if you have a, um, a mains pipe breakage out on the road and they get rubble in the pipe, so they flush it into your house, it usually ends up in the last solenoid valve um, underneath the diaphragm and you'll find this valve won't turn off and you can't work out why. It could be because of that, but we'll talk about valves a bit later. So the controllers that I was talking about, which is this traditional controller, is a 240 volt plug-in controller. So you plug it into a normal PowerPoint and it has a transformer in there that reduces the electricity to 24 volt alternating current. So that's where these cables are coming out. They would join up to these valves. The other way of controlling is to use battery operated controllers. Now, the key difference between a normal wall mount controller and a battery operated node is the delivery of the electricity. You'll see here we've got black and red cables. This yellow cable's for a sensor, so just ignore that for what we're talking about. If that's not cut, it's fine. If that was cut, this won't. This will think that there's been a breakage in the sensor. Black and red cables mean that polarity matters. Red and red means polarity doesn't matter. Black and black means polarity doesn't matter. The colors that come off of these don't matter. The, the, the idea is to be aware of if they're different colors. So, with a, two, uh, a, a traditional irrigation controller that's delivering 24 volt alternating current, it's sending electricity back and forwards down these cables and alternating. That's what the AC stands for, alternating current. What that does is it lifts an electromagnetic pin on this coil, which lifts up. The pressure changes in the valve, water flushes through the valve, and it stays like that until such time that this electricity gets cut, or, and it could get cut physically, or until the controller turns off. The difference between that and the Hunter node is this is a nine volt latching coil. So this sends electricity through these two cables to a coil, which I should have. Well, here's an example. So this is a Rickdale one. It's a different brand. There's red and uh, black cable. That's a DC latching coil. The polarity matters. <laughs> it's advisable you don't mix brands when it comes to DC. Sometimes they'll work, sometimes they don't. It's preferable if you've got a Hunter node, run it with a Hunter valve. If you've got a Rainbird, whatever they make, run it with a Rainbird. If you've got a, I don't even know if Toro make them anymore. Everything Toro makes in that kind of space tends not to work for very long. So it should work, um, black to black, red to red. If it doesn't and you've kind of crossed brands, check that first. Uh, I don't remember, like the guys behind the counter will be able to tell you. I think it's a case of like Hunter will work on anything. Rainbird only works with Rainbird. Toro might work with one or the other. I don't know what it is exactly. In our world, there are very limited numbers of products that stand head and shoulders above every other product in its category and that own the category. This is one of those products. There is no other battery operated solenoid controller that comes close to the Hunter node. Rainbird have tried, Toro have tried. I'm sure there's a bunch of imports that have tried. You know, when you compare the ESP TM2 to the Hunter XC to the whatever, whatever, they're all as reliable as each other in my mind. They have slight differences around how their Wi-Fi is rolled out. 
You compare a Hunter MP Rotator to an R van, they both deliver water, they're both as reliable as each other. You compare the pop-ups, like the Hunter pop-up to the Rainbird pop-up, they, they're both, they've got minor changes around the, the rubber seal, that kind of thing. There's probably one other thing I can't think of at the moment, but this, like from a battery operated valve standpoint, this is, it's no more expensive to use this, that's the crazy thing. So I would be choosing that. And I'm agnostic, you buy whatever you want, like we'll have the same margin on whatever it is. So, so if you use a nine volt battery operated solenoid valve, it's important to remember that you will need to change batteries whenever they need to be changed. Obviously the amount of uh, times that you're turning that on and off will dictate how often you're changing the batteries. One of the good things about the Hunter one now is that it's got two batteries in it, which is designed that you need to replace them less often. Uh, the Bluetooth version of this has a, um, an app that you can pretty much drive past within a certain range and it will tell you how much battery is left on the node. So we sell them to a lot of councils that have roundabouts where they can't get power to it, but they've got water there. Uh, they might drive nearby rather than actually having to put up 400 signs and have six dudes like making sure you don't get run over and dudettes, sorry. Um, and then they'll just check their screen and go, yeah, no, the battery's at two or three bars, we're fine, we can leave it for another season. It's ideal not to use this unless you really need to. Obviously, there's added infrastructure costs. The valves cost more. I think the actual cost per solenoid valve station is more. Um, but then obviously, there's reduced um, copper costs. Like if you've got a long run and you have to run cable all the way out to it, you might find that that's more inexpensive, but you make that decision for yourself. So regardless of how we do it, wire joins matter and wire sizing matters. So if you have a look in there, there's a wire sizing chart there, which I'm not going to go into. I think we stole that from somewhere. All that really matters is that you know that as with water loses pressure versus uh, through pipe, cable, sorry, electricity uses, loses voltage through, you're not gonna be able to clip this, this is shocking. Electricity loses voltage through copper. So for us to reduce the amount of flow loss courtesy of friction with pipe, we have a bigger pipe. Same with copper. So the copper that we've got coming off of this controller is half mil squared. Half mil squared is what most of you will use and you will probably never step out of it unless you start doing commercial projects. 100 meters, 110, 120 meters, you're gonna be fine using this. When we do commercial projects for councils, we do, you know, four mil common and then two and a half or one and a half mil actives. You might come up against that, I'm not sure. It's really important that if you are doing commercial projects and it says to use one and a half mil copper, don't try and shortcut it because you might find yourself coming unstuck. And I think replacing cable is probably going to be one of the hardest things you have to do because it's generally gone underneath a lot of other infrastructure. So. There's a reason why copper is sized the way it is, but from a residential standpoint, you're very, very, very unlikely to require anything other than a half mil. The copper that we sell comes in single core, three core, five core, seven core, nine core, and 13 core. You need one cable for a common. This is if we're using a traditional controller, not a battery operated valve. And you'll need to have the number of solenoid valves as common. So I'll draw this on the board because I think this is probably something worth looking into. Dylan, you steal my text? No. So we have a, obviously an irrigation controller has a common master valve, one, two, three, four. Uh, so if we have the water coming in here. So this is an irrigation controller, this is a manifold. Each of these valves have two cables coming off them. And all this is, is this. So this controller has these orange cables, you probably can't see it from there, but they're what's running the controller. So that's coming out of the transformer. So electricity goes through the plug to the transformer, transforms down to 24 volts goes into here, this is another sensor cable, so no different to the sensor cable that we had on there. If it's looped up, it's fine. You might use that for a rain sensor, a moisture sensor, anything that's an on-off sensor. So 
as I, I'll probably expand on that. So before I said, I think sensors are bullshit. The quality of a rain sensor, I, I find it amusing that people will spend $5,000 on an irrigation system and stick in a $20 rain sensor that controls it all. And the fact is that most rain sensors have probably less than a centimeter orifice to catch an indicative amount of rain that's to cover a whole thousand square meter site. I think rain sensors can be just left now and especially with the introduction of, and there's obviously moisture sensors are different. So if you've got a high quality moisture sensor that's telling you what's happening in the soil, that's fine. But you also need to remember that that moisture sensor is only sensing the soil that it's in. It's not sensing the soil that's 40 meters away. It's, it's not sensing the areas that might be different microclimates. But if we can ignore that rain sensor, and really think weather data. So if we can get, we know what our precipitation is. We've talked about that before. We know how much water we want this to deliver. Let's just tell the controller to talk to the rest of the world. And if we have a rain event, adjust how much you water. If it goes above 30 degrees for a number of days, adjust how much you water. And then you're taking out the need for that. We've got CM1234, which is what I've put up here. C is common. M is master valve. Station one, station two, station three, station four. For us to do this, if we wanted to do common master valve one, two, three, four, we'd need one, two, three, four, five, six cables. The next size up seven, so you'll have a spare. Um, it's probably not bad practice, you know, for us to further expand on your SOPs that you might only use nine core, right? You might find that you only use seven. Perfect. And look, most, most properties now with drip tube and MP rotators, it's unlikely, especially if you send seven into the front and seven into the back, it's probably unlikely you're never going to go past that. So the advantage of that, you standardize your cable so you, you don't have a, an apprentice accidentally grab some three core and run that cable from the controller through the whole house. And you're like, if you run the cable, they're like, yeah, yeah it's all done. And then you're like, this is three core. Like you, you avoid all those things. And, and the, it's easy to say, oh, but I told them not to. If the cable's not there, you don't have that issue. Now, drip tube's probably something that's um, important for you to be aware of a standardization as well. Now. Every one of those pallets could be different and they all look the same because some's 0.3, some's 0.4, some's got copper, sulf, uh, copper oxide impregnated rubber diaphragms, some doesn't, not in this shop, but some uh, is pressure compensating, some's not. So what we find is the most common standardization for that might be that we only have 0.4, we only have 1.6, we only have brown and we only have the one that has the copper oxide impregnated dripper in it. Because it only costs a little bit more, we can use it in gardens, but if we put it under lawn, it's going to be fine. Now, that's for you guys to choose to do whatever you want to do in your business, but the, I think it's like that kind of Apple, like the Apple, what's that Apple phone, your mates, Steve Jobs. The least amount of processes that you can make any one thing, the less complicated it is, obviously that makes sense, and then the less likely that there is a, that there's going to be a problem or a mistake. Anyway. So back to this, master valves aren't really used that often um, in residential irrigation. Commercially, they're used on all sites and um, it's obviously designed so that there's no, there's, there's another safeguard. So we talked about this before uh, when Ollie asked a question about pressure. If we found that this job site had a really high pressure, we might put a master valve in. So that's the water comes through here, goes through a master valve, so the water's passing that way into a manifold and then goes out to each of those solenoid valves. If we had a master valve, the controller would turn on the common and the master valve cable every time it turned on anything. So I'll just draw these. So in Australia, we use black for a common. So the black cable would run to one of each of the solenoid valves, right? And every time the controller has any actions, it sends electricity out the common and then it closes the circuit. You guys would have done basic kind of battery cable, light cable, like complete the circuit, light turns on. This is no... All you're doing is completing a circuit and that controller becomes the switch that decides which circuit gets completed. So when we're wiring up uh, solenoid valves, all we're doing is completing a bunch of different, oh sorry, we're creating a bunch of potential circuits and I won't get this right because I don't have all the colors, but seven cores kind of got black, white, yellow, brown, blue, green. I don't have all those colors. When I used to install, and there's no standardization for this as well, which pisses me off because Irrigation Australia should be the ones that are actually, uh, I guess, managing the standardization of irrigation practices in Australia. Common's black, predominantly because enough people like me have been saying, we use black, we use black, we use black. In America, it's white. And then I used to work through alphabetically down the cable colors. 
and you could do whatever you want, whatever works for your business, but I think it was like black, brown, sorry, blue, brown, blah, blah, blah. I don't have those colors, so for today, we're going to run one to that one. We're going to run a cable to that one. I'm going to run a cable to that one. I think I've got one left, orange. So now, when, so we've programmed our controller, we've done it from an app, we've done it at the controller, whatever works. I find even if your client's not going to use an app, it's really much easier for you from a visual standpoint to program a controller using your phone rather than trying to remember what you've done in the back of a controller. Four station controllers as well are very easy to have four programs running on four stations and all of a sudden you've got 16 watering events when you're only meant to have four. Uh, that's quite a common thing we used to get when I was working behind the counter. People would come in and go, oh, it's just watering heaps. And you're like, oh, well, that's, you've got station one, program A, B, C, D, station two, program A, B, C, D, station three, A, B, C, D, and they were just watering too much. So when we turn on an irrigation cycle for station one, what it will do is it'll send us, it'll complete the circuit through the C and the M, which lifts that pin, opens the valve, rushes water through to the first, second, and third valve. They're all sitting closed. It's also sending electricity through the C and the green cable which opens this valve. So that, it opens that one and that one and water goes through. If at any point any one of these, if that cable got cut, that valve will close. This valve still technically open, but because this solid, uh, the master valves stop sending water, you can't get water out of there. If your common gets cut, all valves stop. So when you, if you have a troubleshooting situation and they're like, and you get to the point where it's cable but only one valve isn't working, it's likely the common's fine and it's obviously the active, which is what we call the other ones. That makes sense? All right. When doing wire joins, I don't care how you do them. I just encourage you to do them well. You can use wire joiners, like these basic crush ones that have got uh, silicon in them. You could solder them and heat shrink them. You can go like full hero mode and get these, these little red caps. They twist and then they lock into these and they're full of gel. These are like direct berry, 600 volt safe. Like you, these are commercial, so you don't need to use them. But... Just remember that you're dealing with electricity and water and obviously people that deal with water predominantly shouldn't really be touching electricity and this is something that if you, you're not going to hurt yourself but if you've got water going up the cables, you're likely to get a deterioration of the system and then all of a sudden it's not working. When you've got problems that are cable related, it can be a real pain because most of the time no one maps where the cable went and you're trying to diagnose where all these cables are and how far back you cut it because of the water that's gone up there. Not as big a deal with multi-core systems. If you were doing commercial irrigation systems and using decoders, they're very sensitive to water and they become lightning attraction rods. And if they're not done well, then you can lose tens of thousands of dollars from one lightning strike. So that's wiring up solenoid valves. Uh, obviously, brands don't matter. Those red cables there could have been black cables in this situation. You can have a Rainbird and a Hunter and a Toro and an Orbit solenoid valve all on the same manifold, it doesn't matter. You could have a manifold that's half this, half PVC. You could have them facing backwards. As long as they're watertight, the electri electrical joins are done properly, the solenoid valves are facing in the right direction, the backflow is in the right direction, everything should work. So I wanna do a little bit on solenoid valve troubleshooting and then we'll go outside and have a play with some sprinklers. Where's Mudge? He was meant to get me a drink. So one of the most common phone calls or issues we get from trade and retail is rela uh, related to solenoid valves. It's not, they're probably one of the more complex things that we sell that's, they're not that complicated. Like for any of you that have been around a little while, this is a newish valve. It's probably 10 or 12 years old and it's no different to the valve before it. It's just black and the one before it was gray. Like, they made a good valve 30 years ago and they've just kept just kept it. The Rickdale ones, which I was playing with one before, where is it? Yeah, like, I don't know exactly. There's a good chance these, this design's older than no, no, this one. The 205, it's like 30 or 35 years old. They just work. So when they don't work, it's really easy to, to diagnose why because there's not too many things, there's not too many moving parts. So if we have... How did I do this before? Water, power, uh, won't turn on. I 
I really had hoped to do this up there and like have this really cool interactive like press button and they pop up. But so with solenoid valves, the only two things they need to work is water and power. The issues that you'll have is they, they won't turn on or they won't turn off. So what I wanted to do is a little bit of a crowd involvement, if you guys are up for it. I don't have any prizes. Um, and if you can just throw up some ideas on, say, why a solenoid valve wouldn't turn on that's related to water. No mains. Perfect. Anyone else? I, and when I ask, I don't know if there's another answer. I haven't thought that far ahead. For cut wires. So that would be power. That's all right. You get in there first. Um, no mains. Won't look. I, I think the only other answer is not enough water. So, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So then that would be hardware. Yeah. How are you hearing me? <laughs> Thank you. See, some people are going to get their probation ticked off, and some are not. Um, so <laughs> that's it's actually probably one of the best ones. The amount of people that have issues with solenoid valves not turning on, and it's because the jewel checks in backwards. And you kind of go, are any of them turning on? Like, no, nah, nothing. I can't even turn them on manually. It's either that or that. Uh, yeah, and they've all got arrows on them. That's the craziest thing, even the solenoid valves. So from a mains water standpoint, there's a lot to that. It could be that the water meter's turned off. It could be that this pipe isn't actually connected to any mains water. It could be that there's an isolation valve turned off. It could be that there's another isolation valve buried two meters away that you know someone put in because they liked double protection. It could be that the backflow's on backwards. If the valves are around the wrong way, they, sh they might just water might just flow through. So it's unlikely to be that, but um, definitely worth checking all that. So reasons why it won't turn off from a water standpoint. Yep. Debris. Too much? More likely to be not enough. And it's flow. Too much pressure would be an interesting... I think if there's too much pressure, you've probably blown the valve up and you've probably broken it. That's what you meant? Yeah. Not enough flow. So if you have a look in any of your um, booklets, around, and you don't have any because I can't see any, uh, hunter guides, rainbird guides, you can go online. Um, every one of the solenoid valves will have a minimum and a maximum flow rate. Usually the minimum to turn on is quite nothing. It'll just open. The minimum to turn off is the issue. And so you talked before about those small courtyard or smaller gardens. There is an amount of drippers or drip tube you could put on a solenoid valve that it won't turn off and it will just never turn off because there's just not enough water flowing through the solenoid valve. So for a hunter, PGV, it's about one and a half liters an hour. Yeah, which is nuts. Like one dripper. Is it one and a half liters an hour or one and a half liters a minute? I think it's one and a half liters a minute, sorry. Because that wouldn't make sense. So if you find yourself in a situation where it's not turning off because there's not enough flow, you might just need to put bigger drippers on. So you might find that you're going to use, you know how we talked about having like higher precip, less watering time. So you put eight litre an hour drippers on instead of twos, or you might have two per pot, or you might get shrublers or whatever it might be. Um, obviously, the debris side of things, you start popping open solenoid valves. Uh, the wheels of commerce keep turning, mate. We've got to keep selling stuff. <laughs> Who do you think buys all the muesli bars? So um, if there's debris, take it apart and start looking. Power, cut wires, so won't turn on anything else? I can't, who was that? Power supply. 100%, yep. And low voltage is an interesting one because it, it'll be the last thing people will di diagnose. Um, cut wires, power supply, and then control. Sometimes the controller actually isn't telling it to be on. So the client thinks it's meant to be on because they programmed it, but they programmed it incorrectly. So cut wires, obviously no power is getting there. Power supply could be that the transformer is actually damaged. So it's, the controller looks like it's okay, but it's not sending enough power out. Or it could be that that cable has just been ripped off. 
uh, could be the, well, the damaged wires, low voltage, that there's not enough voltage getting from the controller to the solenoid valves. Could be because the cable's the right size, the wire joins have just been done badly, or it could be that the cable's undersized or deteriorated. Um, and then obviously the controller, the controller might just be saying, like it's, 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 um, it's been told not to turn on because of a bullshit, uh, what are those things called? Rain sensor? So the rain sensor's had a bird shit in it and now it's just, that's it, it's off forever. Or they've, some of these controllers, you can tell it that the rain sensors are normally open or normally closed and you get it around the wrong way because it's confusing. And effectively, whenever the, it's wet, it'll water and when it's dry, it won't. So that's super rare. And obviously, if you don't put a rain sensor in, you won't have that problem. Um, last one, won't turn off from a power standpoint. This one's pretty basic. Yeah, the controller's told to stay on forever, which is that whole force, like... Everyone, everyone just keeps adding programs, especially the clients that have told you that they haven't touched it. On that, um, you can get uh, controllers now have what they call contractor programming. So you can set a contractor program and put a password on the controller so they can't change it. Uh, or you can have a contractor reset where you can go back and press a certain um, combination of buttons and it will revert back to the programming that you saved on it. So rather than you having to go back through that whole process of reprogramming it. You just do whatever the thing is. I don't know, they were all different and it will revert back. But back to my great business idea that you guys should start. If you have parental control of the controller and you give your client child control of the controller, when they make those changes, you can just change them back or you can take that authorization. The risk you've got is that if you are in charge of their irrigation, and some of you might want to be, I mean, I've talked about it before, $40,000 worth of plants probably is low for some of the people sitting in this room, you might want parental control on that controller for three months because you've said, we are gonna guarantee the plants survive, we've done the soil prep, we've done this, but we have full control of the irrigation. And they say no, you say, cool, plants are yours, do what you want with them. You can do that with your Wi-Fi and have that control. The whole idea behind me going through this table is to go, when you have a solenoid valve issue, start diagnosing the easiest things first. Go to the controller, is it on? Like, is it on? Yep. Is this ball valve on? Is this around the right way? Because what happens is overzealous irrigation contractors will be like, ha, we're going to start ripping solenoid valves apart when there's no wire joints or there's, you know, the solenoid valves in backwards. The last thing you want to be doing is to take this apart and check the diaphragm. Sadly, I think we've got a few experienced heads here. It's very likely that it's something in the diaphragm and there's very likely a rock in there or the diaphragm is broken. It's very, very easy to repair before. So if you get to the point where you're taking these apart, turn the valve off and you won't get wet. The, we can take some apart. If anyone hasn't done this and wants to do it, I've got a drill and a valve here. You can take a valve apart and have a look at the process. Um, we can do that uh, while we're doing the other stuff or we can do it afterwards. There's a few notes there, things to note around ball valves. Obviously, like I said there, if you have an issue with the irrigation system, you really want to be able to isolate it or have your client isolate it without you having to go out there on a Sunday. In a lot of cases, if the weather's not too hot, you might be able to just say, look, if it's leaking, just go out to the box near your letterbox, turn the handle so that it's pointing that way and I'll come out Monday and sort it out. Obviously, then they don't have to turn their water off to their house and you can go back and deal with that whenever you want. What else have we got? Pressure reduction. Probably the only thing I didn't talk about, and I should have talked about it before, when, with, obviously, as I said, if an irrigation system doesn't have an accurate pressure coming into a sprinkler system or to a drip tube system, your precipitation delivery is going to be incorrect or could be incorrect, uh, and then your sprinklers are going to become hard to adjust. MP rotators, you'll find if they don't have the right pressure, you can't get your distance down. There's a bunch of different ways you can do pressure reduction. You would have seen these on all new houses. There are uh, these ones are an adjustable inline pressure reducer that can be under main static pressure, so statics when everything's off. These are a dynamic pressure reducer, so these would go after a solenoid valve, as you can see here. They can't be under static pressure, so you couldn't put that pressure reducer on this side of the solenoid valve because it will break. These are a static pressure reducer. You can put them here, and what we sell these a lot for is mounting to a garden tap to put in front of a tap timer. So if you went and bought a cheap tap timer that's only rated to 690 kPa, which there are a lot of, you put that there, it means that the tap timer is protected and this can be sitting under that static pressure. These are the 
two of the products that I really would love to know how they got invented. These can be retrofitted to solenoid valves under the coil. So you take the coil off, and throw it on the ground, screw that in, put the coil back in there, and this will be a pressure reducer. And I have no idea how it works, but it's adjustable as well. So you can adjust this from 20 to 100 PSI. And these are perfect in a situation where you've gone out and done a job, completely forgot about pressure reduction, or you weren't even aware of it. You've got things blowing. There's concrete there, and there's concrete there, and you can't do anything but put this in. These might be 100 bucks, but the labor component of this is two minutes and they're adjustable. They come in um, They come in most of the brands. This is the Rainbird one. Uh, they come in fixed and adjustable. The last pressure reducer that might be of interest is at the sprinkler. So there are bodies now that have pressure reduction in them. A lot of the commercial jobs that have MP rotators or R vans in them have specified that the sprinkler, we're about to go outside. What have you been doing? Uh, Selling things. Say it, all right. Uh, though, so they'll reduce at the sprinkler head. Uh, the reason that might be relevant is back to my sloped garden. If you've got one sprinkler there and one sprinkler there and that's five meters, that's 50 kPa difference between there and there because of the of gravity of pushing that water down to the lower sprinkler. So you might say that you want to have, like the valves are up here, we need a different pressure reducer on the low sprinklers as we do on the high sprinklers. It's pretty uncommon to see that. Um, or very long runs where you've got pressure uh, dropping through the pipe from start to finish. So Playford Council is a council we do a lot of work with. They'll have massive amounts of flow. And then so they'll do a whole street that might be 150 metres long. And it's just like MP rotators just all the way along. They might adjust. They, they'll have the pressure reducers at the, the sprinkler. So they're all consistent. But also they can, they're not affecting any water that's flowing through the pipe as it's going. So... Um, there's a lot in that, but if you want to talk about that, we can. You might see here, these are a non-return valve for a garden tap. So even if you are, if you do choose to go down the hardware shop route and put a tap timer straight on the tap, you can put these on the tap and put a tap timer underneath it, and this will stop water from going back up into the drinking water supply. That's part of the regulation. And then these are a little pressure, these are a really cheap one. We do a lot of work, not a lot, we do some work with landscapers that might do house and land packages or housing trusts where there is a budget that has to be met, that's when we'll start to kind of introduce these. They're probably 10 or 15 buck pressure reducer rather than a $40 pressure reducer. And then this one here is a pressure reducer filter all in one. We haven't really talked about filtration. It's not something we sell a lot of. If you're concerned, if you've got a property at the river, I'd be looking at big filtration. These pressure reducer filters, I think they used to cost about the same as a pressure reducer. So I'd just be putting these in. They've got a small stainless steel filter in there that'll stop any of the debris that I was talking about from a water mains break out the front. Uh, and then, you know, you're not really going to be opening these up and cleaning them that much because there shouldn't be any dirty water coming through from mains. All right, so what we're going to do now is we'll head outside. I've got a s irrigation system that's pretty much complete. I want anyone that hasn't done this before to kind of put their hand up. I'll get them to screw some nozzles on, do some pipe up, and we'll kind of adjust sprinklers and that kind of thing. Um, and then if you want, you can take a heart solenoid valves. And as I said, I'll be here till four if anyone wants to ask questions. Sorry, I'm taking this real seriously. There's one over there as well. Um, right, so basically these are a flushing nozzle. Right, so <laughs> I'll point it that way. So that there, it's just handy, you can leave it on. So once you've installed the system, before you put these on, give it a really good flush. And when I say a really good flush, don't just turn for five seconds ago, oh yeah, she's all good. Give it a good few minutes. Flush it right out. Um, Those um, caps will flush at a flow rate that's similar to the nozzles. Okay. So you'll find that they should all pop up. Yep. And they should, if Clint turns them on. Oh, fuck. I'll turn it on. Yeah, you do that. I'll just lean up on this thing. So just watch yourself. Watch yourself, Kerry. You might get wet too. No, that one. Yeah. <laughs> I, I pointed that to get him. <laughs> Um, so that's the theory. <laughs> I should have done that. <laughs> we'll do this every time. Um, yeah, so those nozzles, the flushing nozzle, easy to pull up. And then, um, yeah, and then obviously chuck these on. So you can hold them up, undo it like this. 
I'm just going to show you on this first one. Yeah, right. a lot of people put the um, nozzles on before the bodies and then... Yeah. Turn these are, the these are expensive, right? I don't need him getting wet. He's got work to do. I'm going <laughs> home after this. Um, but yeah, if you do just drop them down, they're easy enough to just get these back on, screw it on, lift it back up, right? Uh, there was something else. Oh, that's right. So, the on these the nozzles, the R vans, so if they're not a 360, they've got to start at one point and finish. So that line there on the R vans is your 12 o'clock. That's where it's always going to start from. So let's just say you've got a square patch of turf that you're going to water. You're going to want that line because they're rotating clockwise. You're going to want that line initially at that, that, that edge. So that's your 12 o'clock. It's going to start there. Once you've got it in and it's sort of whoop, essentially, um, here we go. I'm not going to be able to get it on, am I? Oh, you bastard. Now it's all wet. Rightio. So they've screwed that on and it's there. So you can grab the neck and spin around. You can hear it click. And that's roughly in line with that. So I did the first one for you, champ. Um, essentially, we're going to mix these rotators up. So we're going to have our vans with, with MP rotators. Try and not do that. Try and keep them the well, same. You, you don't have the match precipitation. So... Yeah, correct. It's still going to water, but like if you get into a situation where you've got no choice, it's not going to kill anything. But all right, so let's uh, let's chuck that one on there. So yeah, with the uh, MPs, you don't have the white line, yeah, but you do you have a line. Home it's just a bit hard to see. Really. So and essentially, once you get them all on, um, yeah, once you get them all on, then we'll just sort of set up the the radius. Sorry. Uh, just chuck it on first. Whoop. So that one is facing out that way. So I'm just going to go spin it right around. A bit more. So it's essentially facing there. Can you see where it is? You're a pain in the ass. I've given you the short stem, so it's harder. Sorry, mate. So which way is it facing? Yep, so you want that here. It's a pain in the ass. Usually if you just get a good purchase on it, yeah. Oh, look at that. A bit more, because it's there. Beautiful. That'll do it for now. Oh, and I'm gonna need one more nozzle. I want one that's not a 360. These nozzle choices aren't the best. They're just gonna be shooting out as far. Anyone else? You want it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get in there. Wet t so this oh. is a good one because it's a it's a four inch one. Yep. You can actually get a good yep. decent grip on it. Yep. And then chuck that one straight on. Right, so work out, see that's there, you yep. want it there. Okay. Right, so you, the whole shaft. So you're not turning that, you want it like this. Put move your hand for a sec. Sorry, mate. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Where is that? Yeah, a bit, bit more? Yeah, a bit more. Almost done. A bit more. A bit more. Excellent. Happy days. Yeah. Right, you're going to want to move those. <laughs> Right, so now we'll turn them on. And this is where we get wet. We love it because it's a hot day. Simulating it turning on. 
talk about the trial? <laughs> so this one here is sort of just still cutting over, so you can fine tune that. On the R vans, you've got this little here. This is your throw. So you can, that's your minimum throw. And that's maximum. You're going to know your minimum maximum because as you're winding down, it'll get to a point where it clicks. You don't want to overdo the clicks, but once it hits that, um, yeah, you know its limits. All right, same with the maximum. Um, so that's pretty good, actually. And then you can increase the radius. Let's just say you wanted a 180. But then when you want that 90, yeah. He can do that one. <laughs> right, so with the R vans, you don't need the tool, right? I just did all that with my hands. MPs, this is handy. So with the MPs, you got the top of that. That there will open your radius and close your radius. That there, that screw, reduce and ex expand the throw. Uh, no, that's all the MPs, unless it's 360. Oh, okay. Yep. Yep. Because you've got... Yeah, that little chart. So yeah, have a crack at that, mate. So that one's, that one's basically really... See how you're adjusting that throw? So what it's doing is every hole is engineered to throw to a certain spot. So essentially on that whole 360 area, it's, it's aiming for a different spot. So it's pretty technical. And as it rotates around, it's always gonna hit, one stream's always gonna hit a certain spot. Um, does anyone wanna play? <laughs> anyone else that hasn't, you're right? You're like, I'm all over it. That's it in a nutshell. Um, Perfect. Does everyone understand the concept of that? Um, I mean, it's pretty simple. It's just, I guess the biggest thing with these is, um, it's just respecting the nozzle. Like they are expensive. Obviously, if you've got 20 on a job, you know, they're like 12, 13 bucks depending on which one you get, the MPs or the R vans. So if you do rip those filters off, and then you've got mucky water, and you bring them in and go, oh, they're all fucked. And then we go, and you can hear the grinding. There's a lot of people that have tried to get them back to life by spraying shit in them and trying to clean them out, but yeah. So um, yeah, just respect them a bit. Um, right, very quickly, yep. Yeah, sure. So then we got the trip line, right? So over here we've set up a, a line running out to a garden bed. We've got a header pipe here and a header pipe there. So, and we've got two. So obviously this is a bit more than 400. Um, or 300 if you're using point 0.3. So we can put one in, in, the, in the middle there. So we could, we've used a T, a reducing 19 to 13 mil for the drip line. But you can also use these takeoff adapters, which you uh, use the tool, which I think is on Clint's desk. Punch a hole in there, put it in, got your 19, you, you, yeah. And you can use them for tree rings, all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, essentially, same deal. 
But we've got a pressure reducer on this because the pressure you want through your sprinklers isn't necessarily what you want on your drip line. Um, Because it's drenched, you're not going to see it anyway. Look. Is that even on? So that's dripping away. Um, does anyone want to cut it, put some joiners in? No, 30 mil, no. It's up to you. But it's all here if you want to. I don't think anyone does. No one wants to cut it. Come on, these RO boys need to get their hands dirty, I reckon. You don't, we don't have to go to a before. So, dual check technically after the ball valve because if you ever have issues with this you want to be able to isolate the system and then you can work well, on everything downstream. Back. See how we've got a ball valve back there? Yeah. They didn't need to put that there, they could have run the manifold off that three metres of pipe. Yeah. That, because that's a dedicated irrigation line, it's fine. That could be a hundred metres. Right, it's just, no, you can't tap into that and then it's not protected kind of thing. Yeah. But, yeah. Oh sorry, you could tap into that. But then if you ran a drink fountain off that, the drink fountain's not protected. And this is the big issue we see with backflow commercially is they need to have multiple backflows. So they'll have like a park, we'll have a recycled water main, a mains water main, uh, toilet block, drink fountains, irrigation system. And if any of those cross contaminate, you've got your t even your toilet and your drink fountain can't cr cross contaminate, but if you've got recycled water going into a drink fountain, you've got problems. And there's been situations recently where it happened. So that's why the planning, like us planning is so important, but then obviously contractors adhering with those plans is so important. So, but yeah, that can, as far as, but yeah, but it, it could be back there. Like it could have been the one that we used back there, but yeah, yeah. it doesn't have to be right on That's the just pretty much for your visual aid. Yeah, no, I just meant in the, in the, like, the people. Yeah. yeah, well that, like Clint's got on that, that board there, that's pretty much your standard sort of setup. Yep. Um, he's got the tap there. And you could bend that around, like sometimes there's not, like you could have the ball valve here and then the water coming in there and then it bends around because it fits in a valve box better because this is this would be a real shitty valve box like you've got one there one there so you could, might try and like condense it so yeah in this instance you'd have the valve box here you might have six valves and then you might have a little spotter box just for that ball valve yeah. as an isolation the um, other thing if they want to get real tight they'll put the ball valve here and light down on its side so the handle lifts up to turn off and you can squick get them really quite compact uh, thread tape's all right. Yep, yeah. I got. Uh, That's a that'll be a mains pressure rated riser, mains pressure rated riser. Well, hopefully. Well, I think <laughs> risers are. Yeah. All the risers are. So the all the poly risers that we sell are mains pressure rated. Um, yeah. Any questions? I think that's it. So yeah, um, well, I guess we can call it. If anyone's told their boss they're here till four, I'll back that up. Um, Except, like, sure, we never Ollie's say that. We never Ollie's, say that. Ollie's already gone. Oh, he's there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fuck. Yeah, yeah you guys left at four. Um, <laughs> thanks for coming. I know it's probably challenging, especially for business owners to pull their staff out on a day where you could be working, but I hope that what you took from this today will enable you to be more efficient and, and I guess put better quality <laughs> irrigation systems, which should re replace those hours in quality of work. So, um, as I said, I'll be here till four, as Mudge will be here till whenever. Um, so if you want to stick around and ask questions that you were too embarrassed to ask or that might be specific to your job sites, then by all means stick around. Help yourself to the drinks and the food on the way out. Um, I got in trouble for not putting that away last week. So. No, so don't I. Indirectly. All the chocolate melted. So, yeah, <laughs> grab some. Anyway, thank you very much.